In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. A few years ago, my daughter, Renata, announced that she was going out to see a movie with some friends. Um, the movie was called March of the Penguins. You may be familiar with it. Uh, it uh, she came home about two hours later, looking a little bit peeved. Apparently it was a movie which for an hour and a half showed Penguins marching. And her comment at the time was, I thought it was a metaphor. But that's, that, isn't that our dilemma too, right? When, when we, we hear these stories in Scripture, we read the promises of God in Scripture, we, we accept that God is, is infinitely wiser and more loving and greater than we are, and deserving of our obedience. But when God speaks to us, how do we really know what God means? When we accept Scripture as true, but at what level of detail? What does faithful obedience look like? Am I supposed to run out and go and do something in response to what I've just heard in the Scriptures? Am I supposed to sit and wait patiently? How do I know? What happens if I get it wrong? What happens if I get it right? Because this was Abraham's problem, right? What does God really mean here? You remember that, that Abraham was, was all of 75 years old. He was called Abram back then. And he and his wife, who at that time went by the name of Sarai, were childless. And God said to them, pack up and go someplace. I won't even tell you where it is till you get there. But I'm going to make of you a great nation. So Abraham went. And Sarai went. And for 11 years they waited patiently. No great nation. Not so much as a single child. And so then Abraham starts to think, hmm, maybe I was supposed to actually do something to help this along. I know, maybe I was supposed to adopt my manservant and make him my son, and that's how I'm going to become this great nation, this great people. When you hear the word nation in Scripture, don't think, don't think geopolitical state. Think ethnic group. Think family. So maybe I should do that. And God says, no. I promised you descendants, and they really are going to be your own offspring. Well, that didn't happen. And so, so Abraham and Sarai try the surrogate mother thing with, with Hagar, and that doesn't work out. God says to Abraham again, look, let me spell it out for you. Your descendants are going to be your descendants, and they are going to be as numerous as the dust of the land. And so Abram waits patiently again for another 13 years. Still no nation. Still no child. And again, Abram finally gets around to complaining to God and says, look, this isn't happening. I'm 99 years old now. And God says, one more time, I'm going to spell it out for you. Your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand of the seashore. And by this time, Abram is laughing at that as a, as a promise. And when it's communicated to Sarai by mysterious visitors who show up, she laughs as well. And then the promise comes true in detail. Now that's all well and good, perhaps, you might think. That's well and good for, for Abraham and Sarah, as they're now known. But how about us? What about if the details of my life don't quite match the details of the story? Is it still true? Is God, are God's promises still going to be reliable? Maybe I'm as old as Abraham. Maybe I'm like, like this guy I read about in the newspaper when I was on vacation. He just turned 104 years old. The reporter asked him, what's the best thing about being 104? The guy said, no peer pressure. <laughs> What if, I'm, what if I'm that old? But I still feel the pressure. What if I feel like my life is, is, is gaining in length, but not in satisfaction? What if the promises don't seem to be coming true? What if I don't feel complete, that I've fulfilled the mission that God has given me? 
Or what if, on the other hand, instead of being old and childless, maybe, maybe you're young and have too many mouths to feed. Maybe you're struggling with infertility yourself. Or back up even farther, maybe the biggest challenge right now in your life is getting a date on Saturday night. What if none of these things seem to be on the horizon for you? How much detail can you trust? How far can God's promises be relied on? And I'll tell you the answer. We don't know. We can't rule out the possibility that God will fulfill a promise to you in detail through a miracle. Maybe March of the Penguins really is about penguins marching after all. It certainly happened that way for, for Abraham and Sarah. The miracle child does get born, Isaac. And they love him. And he is the beginning of the promise, and he is the most cherished being on the face of the earth for Abraham and Sarah. But we have to keep in mind that the covenant God made with them, the promise God gave to them, that they would begin a great nation was not given to them alone just so that they could hear the pattern of little feet in their tent. There's something much larger at stake. The promise continues beyond giving them a child or giving them descendants. And instead God says, and in you all nations of the earth will bless themselves. The promise isn't just for them flows out through them. And that's a good thing because today the story takes a very disturbing, ominous turn. Because here they have enjoyed the presence of Isaac in their midst for 10, 11, 12, 13 years. And God now turns around and orders Abraham to sacrifice the miracle. And at this point, maybe a little less detail in the fulfillment of the promise might be a good thing. You and I can take comfort in knowing the outcome of the story. You and I know that, that God sends an angel and that the angel tells Abraham to stop before he makes a tragic and terrible mistake. But what about the times when you and I feel called upon to make impossible choices? When faithful obedience seems to mean letting go even of the people we love the most. Do we trust God then? Perhaps we have even struggled with trusting God to deliver on, on a good promise to give us a blessing. We trust that God will maybe move the earth itself to bless us. But what if God wants to move us? to bless the rest of the earth. Can we respond in faithful and patient obedience? And what if we can? What does that mean? And what if we can't? What if we get it wrong? Or what if we, we get it right but we can't stand the implications? It's too painful to think about. What if all of our hard work and all of our sacrifice winds up blessing not us and our own family and our own descendants, but somebody else? What if the hard work and the sacrifice that is demanded of us is too much to manage? What if we're not up to it? That's why we're here today. We're not here today because you and I have all the right answers. And we're not here today because we know the secret password or the handshake. We're not here because we're strong and loving and wise and infinitely patient and trusting in God. We're here today because we need help. And we're here today because help has come to us in that blessing that has flowed down from the original covenant with Abraham and Sarah, that has flowed down through their family, that has come down to the whole earth, and that includes us. Through their sons and their daughters it came, through David, the ruler of, of the great kingdom of Israel in its heyday, in its golden age, a magnificent and unified kingdom. That blessing continued 
even as the kingdom broke up, even as kings of Israel and Judah saw their people deported to Assyria and Babylon. And it continued as the people came back to Jerusalem. And in the end, the blessing flowed down and landed upon Jesus. And it was his faithful obedience that completed the sacrifice that Abraham was enabled to, to offer. It is his sacrifice that completes the sacrifices we cannot make. It is his faithful obedience that allows the blessing to flow through to us. That blessing is called the Holy Spirit. And Jesus pours that out. He and his Father pour that Holy Spirit out upon his disciples who become his apostles and his prophets on whom he establishes and builds his church with himself as the cornerstone. And it doesn't matter whether you're 104 years old or four years old or four months old, or four days old. It doesn't matter whether you have a house full of children or an empty nest. It doesn't matter whether you have to deal with, with a thousand hungry mouths to feed, or just one thirsty child on a hot day. Or whether you're enjoying your honeymoon or living into the difficulties of, of solitude at an advanced age. It doesn't matter whether you got here by birth or by adoption. But you and I and we are all part of that one same family of blessing. And we gather here every Sunday for a family reunion. And we do it not because we got it right, but because we don't. We gather together to, to reconnect with one another and to help each other reconnect with the God who sends that blessing down upon us continually. Here we learn by listening to one another, by listening to the stories, yes, of Abraham and Sarah, yes, the words of Scripture, yes, but also to each other's stories about the ways that God has spoken in our lives and the ways we responded and which ones turned out well and which ones didn't and how Jesus Christ was there in every single one of them, blessing us, forgiving us, raising us back up, giving us strength, healing us, delivering us. Here we gather as, as any family reunion does, to share a bit of food and drink, to tell the stories, to enjoy each other's fellowship, and in the process of doing that, to learn to recognize the voice of the messenger of God, the angel telling us, don't go through with that. It's a mistake. Or the voice of God urging us to make the hard choice even when it seems to be to mean giving up on, on everything we had hoped for. Here we learn to tell the difference. We learn the art of discernment that is also a gift of grace of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And whether those promises are fulfilled in our lives in the same kind of an excruciating and, and glorious detail that is described in, in the stories of scripture, or whether it's in some less obvious way, some more remote way, it is that blessing that has come down to us, that gift of the Holy Spirit that enables us to share both blessing and sacrifice together with joy and with gratitude. That's what enables us to gather here and celebrate the Eucharist that great act of thanksgiving, literally, Eucharist, giving thanks, because there is no better response to the blessings of God than thank you. And because we need the real food and the real drink without which the journey is too hard. We need the body and blood of Christ flowing in our veins, absorbed into our own selves, body, mind, and spirit, because that and that alone is what makes us unified as a family far more surely, far more unbreakably than any genetic, biological relationship ever could. We gather here to listen to the voice of God and to respond, to serve as channels of grace for one another, 
to extend forgiveness, to share strength, to comfort each other in sorrow, to rejoice together in gladness, the healthy supporting the sick, the rich supporting the poor, the wise sharing wisdom with those who are just beginning to learn, and all of us learning how to hold our blessings firmly and yet at the same time lightly, so that we turn ever more in gratitude towards the giver of those great gifts, rather than being plunged into bitterness and envy and worry when we become slaves to the gift itself. This is the family we are. This is the church. The God who once made a covenant with an aging childless couple continues to pour out blessings upon us through them. If you're new here this morning, welcome. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family of Abraham and Sarah. Welcome to the family of Mary and Joseph and Jesus. Welcome to a family that has among it kings and priests and queens and prophets and the poor and sinners. Welcome to the family of God, the Father's family, in whom every family on earth has its name and from whom Every family on earth is blessed. Welcome to that blessing.